Thank you all so much for joining my live. I'm very excited because tonight I have a very special guest, uh, Mike Meharry from the 10th Amendment Center and his lovely wife, Cynthia Meharry. Hello guys, how are you? Hey. Hey, what's shaking? Nada. <laughs> <laughs> hey, all right, perfect. Well, we're gonna have a very loose forum we're gonna have a cool exchange of questions from live the live audience. And then we're also gonna play a game. Are you guys prepared to play the um, newlywed-ish game? We are, but I'm kind of nervous about it. What if I lose? Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, you probably will. It's a lot of pressure. You. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, yes. So uh, uh, some of you may be familiar with Mike's work. Mike works for the 10th Amendment Center. Um, he's the communications director. His wife is pretty badass in her own rights. So I'm going <laughs> to give you, oh, we're getting engagement right now. It takes a little bit of time. So yeah, we're going to banter and like, yeah, people are slow, aren't they? So we're just going to randomly talk for a few minutes. If that's okay. Are you guys cool with rambling? Your show. We roll with okay. you. <laughs> All right, awesome. So I will give out your bios because you guys are fancy pants. So <laughs> fancy pants. We're gonna have some fun. So I want to uh, give out Mike's bio. A lot of you are familiar with him, but Michael Meharry serves as a national communications director for the 10th Amendment Center and a managing editor, editor for the Shift Gold blog. How you doing with Shift Gold? Um, yeah, he hosts his own podcast. Gold. Yeah. Buy it now. It's is going it, up. Is it going well? <laughs> okay. <laughs> he hosts his own podcast, Thoughts from Mary Head. And also, I would like to add, which wasn't in the bio that he uh, I looked up, he uh, manages Godarchy, which is probably one of my favorite blogs because I'm an anarcho Christian. I'm one of those. Um, so, super cool. Yes. Um, so that's what Mike does. Some of you may be unfamiliar with his lovely wife. Hey, Cynthia, give us a shout out. Hi. You're so kind. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to give your bio out. So Cynthia Meharia, Meharry is a professional genealogist specializing in <clears throat> deed, taxless, will, court, and vital records research. Residing in Kentucky, the original gateway to the West. Is it? I didn't know yes. that, but that's awesome. Yes. Her wheelhouse is the late 18th century through the mid 20th century. I have so many cool questions for you because I love genealogy. <laughs> um, and there's a certain show on PBS that I'm obsessed with. <laughs> Finding your roots. And so I don't know if you're familiar with it. Are you? Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. I, I watched think it that's once. that's super cool. <laughs> <laughs> Just once? Yeah. Okay. Uh oh. Um, We've already going to have conflict. <laughs> okay. So I'm looking for questions down at our, um, our questions board. Do we have good engagement, Patrick? I hope so. Give me some questions. Um, other than our bios and things like that. So I want to start with you, Mike. Um, so you work for the 10th Amendment Center. And uh, a lot of what you talk about is decentralization. Right. And the Constitution. But I also know that you're an anarchist as well as I am. True story. Weird, isn't yes. it? Wait, what? <laughs> it, <laughs> no. Do you oh, know? No. This is a relationship hazard. <laughs> she Cynthia, knows. did you know your husband was an anarchist? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Mike, I want to know a little bit about um, how you came to be an anarchist. So, tell me a little bit about uh your political story how you began and and where you are now so sometimes i'll, I'll say the 10th amendment is the gateway drug to liberty because that's really how it started <laughs> for me uh, i kind of came from the right 
I was in the uh, hardcore neocon camp back in my younger days. Like I sat I in front that. of the TV during the first <laughs> Gulf War and thought that was cool entertainment. Uh, something I'm not terribly proud of at this point in my life, but you know, it is what it is. And like a lot of conservatives, conservatives, I got caught mm -hmm. up in the uh, Tea Party movement in uh, about, I guess it was what, 2010, 2009, 2010, mm -hmm. when Obama uh, was in office and started going to some rallies and stuff around town. And I had just gotten finished with school, journalism school. And I thought, well, I want to use my ability to write to, you know, make the world a freer place to, to promote mm -hmm. liberty. Of course, at that point, I didn't understand that Republicans didn't have anything to do with liberty, but, you know, live, live and learn. Yeah. Uh, so I got involved with the Tenth Amendment Center because I always had this innate sense that government was supposed to be limited. You know, that that's that was the Republican mm -hmm. mantra. We're going to have limited government. And so I knew that the Tenth Amendment was something that had to do with limited government. It uh, constricted the role of federal power, at least in theory. And so uh, I got involved mm -hmm. with these crazy Tenth Amendment Center people who happened to be libertarians and through that organization, I was exposed to people like Tom Woods and uh, and started reading, uh, you know, more hardcore libertarian and anarchist stuff. And then it was just from there, just kind of a gradual uh, evolution as I began to learn, as I began to think about the philosophy, as I began to try to apply it consistently, I came to realize that, uh, you know, if you're going to be consistent with the ideas of self-ownership, and if you're going to be consistent with the idea of the non-aggression principle, then the state simply can't exist. They're not compatible in a philosophical sense. So then that raises the question, and I'm sure somebody's going to ask, well, why are you still doing the Constitution <laughs> stuff? Because that's the ultimate in statism, right. which right. is true. But the fact of the matter is, uh, to quote, well, not quote Murray Rothbard, but to paraphrase Murray Rothbard, Parroting ultimate principles isn't enough. We have to do something to deal with the world we live in. And we live in a world that mm -hmm. is dominated by the federal government. And mm -hmm. the Constitution was written in such a way as to place limits on that federal government. That gives us a tool to push back against federal overreach uh, through the system as it exists. And, and by doing so, we can move towards a more decentralized system. We can devolve power away from Washington, D.C. And I believe the biggest threat to liberty is ultimately consolidation of power. Centralization is the gravest threat to liberty. If we can decentralize and break it down, then that gives us opportunities to break it down even farther uh, to you know, eventually get down to where we uh, nullify it to the individual. But to that point, we need something that we can use within the system as it exists to expand, expand liberty and to try to attack the system. And the Constitution provides that means, and that's what we do at the Tenth Amendment Center every day. Super cool. So I actually have a question from a disenthrall viewer. Um, I'm trying to break this down. I'm sorry, I'm being unprofessional right now, closing a window. <laughs> um, so are so cute um so in that vein the disenthrall viewer asks how can individuals who desire to help support network with tac the 10th mama center i'm sure donations are a big part that may be an, an assumption how can we all get involved with the 10th amendment center so what can they do to um get involved with the 10th amendment center that's actually a cool so, question that's a great question <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. we have a membership program, and you can actually be a member of the Tenth Amendment Center. I don't know, I keep doing air quotes. It's my thing tonight. Uh, but okay. we have memberships as low as two dollars a month, and that's really how the organization supports itself financially. Um, and and members get access to certain uh, things that the general public does not get access to. You know, we don't just give, we don't just take your money and give you nothing in return. We're good capitalists over at the 10th Amendment. <laughs> yeah. We are not tax deductible. And some people ask, well, why don't you be, be nonprofit? And quite honestly, we didn't want to be tangled up in the IRS rules. Um, so we're not nonprofit, but we do have a, a great membership program. So that's one thing you can go to 10th Amendment Center dot com slash members, I believe is, is where you find that. Uh, or just go to the main page and there's a, a link there to the membership page. The other thing that we're always looking for is people who are interested in volunteering. And, and one of the one of the best things you can do is go to the 10th Amendment Center blog. You'll find 
especially this time of year, a whole bunch of different bills that we're tracking and supporting as they work their way through state legislatures. These are all bills that in some way push back against federal power. And if you see a bill that is in your state, one thing you can do, you can take 10 minutes and make a huge difference. You can contact your state representative and your state senator and ask them to support those bills. Five or 10 minute phone call will do infinitely more than calling Washington, D.C. would ever do. If you've ever called Washington, D.C., you get to talk to an intern who, if they don't agree with you, will probably insult you and be rude and condescending and not have any earthly idea what you're yeah. talking about. And then you might get an email about three months later thanking you for calling and probably having nothing to do with what you actually talked about. State legislators are actually much more responsive to phone calls and, uh, and, and emails. So just simply taking that five or 10 minutes to support these bills can really help move them through the legislative process. So those are the two things. We, we, we'd love to have you as a member, but more importantly, we really want you to get involved in, in state and local activism uh, to push back against government at all levels. Well, I'm definitely a fan of um, using the system against itself. And so I get a lot of uh, pushback from being a part of the LP and um, using uh, the system against itself. But I would agree. I think that's definitely uh, a place to there's it's a multi pronged attack. And so right. we can use the legislature to attack. But I want to go back. And I want to ask Cynthia some questions. OK, Ooh, fun. So, yes. So um, I know that you are a uh, genealogist, which I find very fascinating. And so um, I have researched my father's uh, genealogy a lot. He's uh, adopted. And so I've gone back and researched that. So I want to ask you specifically, Cynthia, like, what what drove you into being interested in genealogy? And if you had some interesting stories of people that um, maybe you found some interesting things about and they were surprised, maybe you could tell some cool stories about that. So let me know. OK, so um, my interest in genealogy actually started well over 20 years ago. Um, actually, it started when I was in school as a kid. We had an assignment to go home, take this family tree, talk to your and talk to your mom and dad and your grandparents and bring this back filled out because, you know, we're going to do your family tree. So went home and I'm like, Mom, I've got this assignment. I've got to find out who all these people were. Can you help me? And so she helped me and we had grandparents on there, her grandparents. And that's as far as we got. But I thought, wow, this is really great because I've never heard some of these people. I go to school with my little assignment and there were kids there that bought in these tomes that their parents had and all of their history and just lots of stuff. And so I thought, oh, well, hmm, I guess we just don't know. And then that kind of laid there for the next 10 or 15 years. And I didn't think anything about it until I had my own child. And after the two o'clock feedings, I could never go back to sleep. <laughs> And with the internet was kind of new and Ancestry was on there and you could get on there with the dial up and the <laughs> So it would eat up the time in the middle of the night and I started to research and I started to find out more and more about my family. And that was probably in the late nineties that I started to actually research and it just continued every year. I just never put it, put it away completely until I finally decided, you know, I really just like to do this. And I found out that Boston University had um, a, a class you could take and then a certificate program that you could do. And uh, I did both of those. So I do have a certificate from Boston University in genealogical research. And I'm not a certified genealogist, as all of the certified genealogist people are quick to pounce on you and tell you you're not certified. I know I'm not certified, <laughs> um, but uh, I do have a certificate. Uh, I have been taught. I've taken different classes. I, the Association for Professional Genealogists, I'm a member of that organization, and they have a continuing education requirement. And I blow that thing out of the water every year. I go to lots of conferences, lots of lectures. I read, 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 and I am a working genealogist. So I actually research in archives and courthouses and online. So um, that's mm -hmm. kind of how I came from, went from nothing to where I am now. And I can't remember your other question. I think, stories. <laughs> no, I think that's actually 
awesome. And uh, if there's some type of professional certification, well, I would say F that. If you know what you're doing, then that's pretty awesome. Um, I actually have a large interest in genealogy because my father is adopted and we very much tried to look into his genealogy. So I would ask you in the same vein of that question, like, um, so you look into court records and birth records and the, that type of thing. Has there ever been um, somebody that you've looked into genealogy for or just kind of traveled down a path where you found something really interesting um, and maybe kind of surprising somebody about their genealogy? And if you have that, maybe you could share it. Um, I can share a story with you. Um, okay. I was conducting some research for a person that lived out of state and they were trying to find, um, I can't remember what generation it was at this point, but the, the man's name, we'll call him John Smith. Um, okay. They couldn't figure out what happened to John Smith. He just disappears. And so they wanted to try to figure out what happened to him. And so I went back and we're talking, um, early 1800s uh, late 1700s is when this man was alive and so i go back and you start in tax records and that's where you figure out um, because people had to pay taxes every year you were assessed so i figured out when he stopped paying taxes one place and where he started paying taxes another he'd moved but then he fell off the tax rolls completely at one point and i want to mm -hmm. say it was like oh hmm, nine maybe 1809 but i couldn't okay. figure out what happened to him and and this is where I went to, yeah, I love to just think outside the box. Um, he apparently, the some of those court records were lost. So wherever his will or his, um, and when his estate was settled by the courts, can't find it. But the newspapers, where I found out what happened to him. So in the newspapers, I was able to figure out that somebody gut shot him and he died in the middle of the street oh, shit. that's what happened to him so i was able to tell these people so this is what happened to him and they were drunk in a saloon and he wasn't faster that's what happened to him and they, they actually yes. the way they told the story in the newspaper was very not the way they tell stories in newspapers today it was pretty mm -hmm. graphic and very uh, judgmental about the two people that were involved <laughs> But it was very interesting, and the family found it interesting as well. She also found well, in the newspaper actually, that my grandfather, my grandfather got busted for um, fornication. Oh, no. <laughs> he actually got fined. Yeah. You're a horrible person. <laughs> Fifty dollars. That's yeah. pretty funny. It really is. Um, I actually have, um, I actually have some questions from people uh, online. So. Are you saying it's a great idea to not use the state that isn't practical? People have blind belief in authority, and we leverage that blind belief to advance our cause and freedom. I don't know. That's kind of like a mixed up question. Maybe, Mike, you want to take that? Um, it's asking about authority in the state. So, but that's a question from a different disenthrall viewer so i guess i mean i'm just looking at reality authority of the state exists mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we can't pretend that it does well i guess we can pretend that it doesn't exist but it doesn't do us a whole lot of right. good to pretend that it doesn't right. exist and so if we have things that we can do within the system that break up the power of the system then I think we should utilize those. I mean, ultimately my goal is to live more free. That's what I wanna mm -hmm. do. And, you know, reading Rothbard doesn't really make me more free. I have to do something mm -hmm. within the system to make me and, and my children and my wife and the people around me more free. And so that's what we're trying to do at the 10th Amendment Center by, by limiting federal surveillance, by uh, pushing for, uh, you know, legalization of marijuana and hemp and ignoring FDA rules and, and those type of things. 
Uh, those mm -hmm. those things make us, from a practical standpoint, more free. Meanwhile, we continue to to talk about the philosophy. And we continue to talk about the illegitimacy of the state. So it's kind of a two pronged approach. It's interesting because I, I'm really interested in the period of history leading up to the Civil War uh, during the. Um, fugitive slave era, I like to call it, and, and looking at the way mm -hmm. northern states attacked the issue of slavery and, and the way they defied federal law to protect runaway slaves. You know, that was a very, very uh, poignant example of how uh, state power was used to resist federal power to the benefit of people that had run away from slavery. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it's interesting reading some of the abolitionists at that time. And I think it was William Lloyd Garrison who, who basically said, from, from a rhetorical standpoint, we are always going to go for the absolute abolition of slavery. But in the meantime, mm -hmm. we're going to take every strategic step that we can to limit its impact. So that's kind of the, the mm -hmm. Tenth Amendment Center prospect. We want to, we would love to eliminate the state, but along the way, we're going to crack as much as we can, the, the federal power. And like I said, to me, the monopolization, monopolization of government at the federal level is, is the gravest threat to us here in the United States. The more power is centralized, the more people it impacts. So I've never, I will, you will never hear me state, say that state governments are good or local governments are good or that mm -hmm. they're even better, but it's just the fact that there's more of them and it disperses authority and power throughout the system. And you can use those, those little areas of power against each other. No, I think that's actually a great point. And um, I have one more question from a distance wall viewer about federalism. So I will uh, pass it off to you. Um, are you saying it's a great ideal to not use the state that isn't practical? People have blind belief in authority and we leverage what blind belief is to advance freedom. So what they're saying is, can you use the state to perpetuate uh, freedom? I don't know. It's kind of a creepy question. <laughs> um, can you use the state to perpetuate freedom? No, I think yes. you can use the state. I think you can use the state against itself to limit the power of the state. So you can use the, the, the state governments to limit the power of federal government, and that will advance freedom. Uh, I think ultimately, whenever you have government, whenever you have the state, it's it's a limit on our freedom. We want to get rid of as much of that as possible. Ultimately, we'd like to get rid of all of it. Um, but mm -hmm. you know, that's going to take a massive change in the mentality of people. And I think he, I think he's right about the blind, uh, the blind a, a devotion to authority. Uh, I think that's very true. And and there's going to have to be a change in the way people think, which is what is that's why what we're doing is so important in discussing uh, these things and discussing the philosophy of liberty. That's what I do at Godarchy, uh, particularly directed at Christians. But, you know, trying to mm -hmm. to make people understand uh, what it means to truly be uh, to to embrace self-ownership and to embrace non-aggression. Uh, but. Like I said, along the way, we need to take the practical steps as well. So it's it's a two pronged approach. But ultimately, we've got to change hearts and minds because you're not going to have a free society until people want a free society. And we're not anywhere near that place right now. This is very true. Um, but I'm going to divert our conversation into a very fun game. Are you oh guys ready? Got my whiteboard. Jason. Hey, Kason, bring it on. Um, we're going to play a game. This is called the newlywed-ish game. <laughs> if you guys have been married too long. Okay. Are you ready? Okay, let's do so it. So I will ask you a series of questions. And what you need to do with your whiteboards or whatever you have is to answer it in the other person's Pejorative. So, um, if I ask a question of you that you're, I would ask of your partner, you have to answer it in kind. So, right. Okay. Okay. Are are you guys cool with that? Yeah. Cool. We'll do it. Okay. Are you good, Cynthia? I'm good. I'm good. Okay. 
All right. So I would ask this of you. Um, and you have to answer it like your spouse would answer it. Okay. Right. I'm answering in her voice. <laughs> Super. You and, 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 and like voice. kind. It's only my voice. Yes. <laughs> okay. What gift that your spouse gave you came as the biggest surprise? Now, In write it down. our whole lives? Yes. <laughs> write it down. Oh, I don't know. No, oh, you guys are broken. <laughs> <laughs> See, oh no! Just write it down. All right. <laughs> I don't even I know snore. how I would answer this question. Fine. Oh, he knows. You don't, Mike. Sorry about your luck. Okay. Hey. Are this you ready? Hard. Yeah. I know, right? Okay. Okay. Mike. Mike. Yes. Please present your answer. All right. So I was think that actually I think the Christmas gift that I just gave her might be the answer. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Which was a gold bracelet. Yeah, that was <gasps> really I had no idea. Okay, Cynthia, please present your answer. Okay, so this is a gift I gave him like several years ago. And I gave him NFL okay. Sunday ticket. Oh, that's right. You did. <gasps> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that's a good answer. We've yeah. established we've established like kind. Now it's gonna be controversial because I'm gonna make you guys fight against each other for the next question. Are you ready? Sure, win. <laughs> okay. So what you need to do is to answer like the other person. So I'm going to ask you a question and you have to answer like you think your partner would answer. Are you ready? Right. Yep. Okay. <laughs> this is going to be really fun. So you say. Okay. Okay. Mike and Cynthia. <laughs> who usually gets their way with things now you have to answer that in your partner's voice oh she's already writing like you're screwed <laughs> <laughs> <My way. laughs> who gets their way Ooh, we got the music we do Jason's kind of awesome. Indeed. I have to pee too. <laughs> <laughs> well, damn. Is the music drowning that out? Is that part of the shenanigans? It is. Okay. Oh, <laughs> did you finish? Yeah, we're ready. Okay. All right. All right. So the end of the questions. Um, Cynthia, please reveal your answer. Mike would say, she does. That's oh. absolutely what I would say. Mike? I think she would say she does. <laughs> oh, look at say, that! Do. You win, Cynthia! Bad ass! That's awesome! <laughs> she Did definitely she? gets she just won. Okay, good. Okay, we know who rules the kook. <laughs> yeah. <Duh>. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's because I'm so easygoing and I really don't care. Yeah. He does. <laughs> I don't know about that. Okay. So we we shall have one other shenanigan. All right. I'm going to look into a much deeper question. Uh -oh. this, is very much, this is very difficult for couples. Okay. Okay. So you have to write out your position on what you would think your partner would think. Okay. 
if your spouse could change jobs, what would his or her dream job be? Write it out. Dream job. Mm-hmm. Do it. That's I'm ready. This is happening. <laughs> She's writing a book. Well, I'm thinking about <laughs> your, your true heart. Okay. <laughs> it's awesome. Okay. I'm ready. Okay. Cynthia, you're first. What is Mike's dream job? Professional beach goer. <laughs> That's, awesome. That's accurate. I was actually thinking okay. musician, but beach beach goer is oh. better. Well, I get to do that with you. True. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, beach bum definitely. Yours? What was yours? Well, she is on the path to her dream job, which is genealogist. Oh, okay. Oh, you're being sweet and supportive. <laughs> oh, look at you guys. Get out of town. Okay, then we're going to get back to seriousness. All right. Oh, that wasn't serious? It was It was semi-serious. It was fine. <laughs> you guys are cute. Everybody loves you. It's fine. We love you, um, too. Oh, you guys are super fun. When, when did we come talk down about there, Flat Earth? Oh. You want to do that? No. For real? Okay, let's not. Let's just skip that together. But I, oh, think look, I, know I have some questions. I have some questions from some people on distance roll. Okay. Here's a distance roll question. Okay. What do you think about argumentation ethics? I'm not sure what that even means. So let me go scroll back. I think there's a little bit of, um, okay. Disenthrall. What are the most hopeful, successful prospects you've seen so far with the 10th Amendment Center outside of states legalizing, decriminalizing um, cannabis? I think it's a cannabis question. So maybe just I'll lead you into that. So they're asking the biggest, biggest successes besides weed, I think is mm -hmm. probably with their yeah is that right yeah pretty much i would say the um the right to try movement is uh, weed is obviously number one and then hemp mm -hmm. you can put that in with with uh with marijuana but the uh, right to try movement which if people aren't familiar with that uh it started um mm -hmm. oh, about four or five years ago with a couple of states basically passing laws that allowed people to try uh, people that had terminal illnesses to try experimental drugs that had not yet gotten FDA approval. So mm -hmm. there was a there was a way for people to apply through the FDA to get into these programs, but it was very hard. A lot of red tape. Uh, a lot of people were rejected. And you know what's more ridiculous than having a federal agency tell you you can't try a treatment when you're dying? So a number of mm -hmm. states started passing laws to bypass the FDA. Uh, create a structure within the state to allow people to try these experimental drugs, uh, shield physicians from, uh, you know, arrest and, and whatnot. And this quickly moved in. And by the middle of last year, there were 40 states that had passed state right to try laws. So then all of a sudden, the federal government passed its own right to try law. And then mm -hmm. everybody, you know, Congress tried to take credit for, oh, we're doing this wonderful thing. And now people will have access to these experimental treatments and 40 states had already had done it. So this is a prime example of where you have a bottom up uh political process where things start at a state level and then they work them way work their way up to the federal level same thing that that happened with marijuana but uh what's really cool is now that the uh right to try is in place for terminal illnesses now we have a bill that's been introduced in texas that would expand right to try uh for people who have uh just chronic illnesses so that's one of the cool things that I've really learned about strategy when it comes to legislative work. A lot of times libertarians will poo-poo 
a given bill because it doesn't go far enough. You know, they want the whole mm -hmm. damn loaf of bread yeah. right now. And we mm -hmm. will support bills that you only get a slice of bread. But almost in every case, when you get the slice of bread, then the next year you'll see an inter a bill introduced to build on that. So it's a step-by-step -step process. And it's really interesting. Progressives have been really good at this. If you watch the left, we have gotten to the place that we are politically in this country uh, in terms of a lot of these leftist and socialist policies because they've taken it one little bite at a time. Uh, so I think it's really mm -hmm. important from a strategic standpoint to, to find cracks that you can stick your foot in and then expand those out. We're seeing the same thing in mar with marijuana now. You know, states that legalize for medical, then the next step is they, is they legalize for recreational. Uh, we're starting to see a lot of mm -hmm. states do expungement bills where people that were charged under previous marijuana laws, those those are uh, those convictions are taken off their records or even those arrests. So uh, very much a step-by-step bottom-up process, but it definitely works. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. No, I, I would definitely agree. And I think the bottom-up process is maybe something that libertarians, um, so many of us, uh, like, just disavow ourselves from and I think it's definitely necessary and I know a lot of people don't appreciate the LP but we actually do fight on the local level for these um, laws and changes in these laws and I think it's actually pretty awesome so you know that's something that anybody can get involved in too there is some kind of garbage that's going on at your local level right now that mm -hmm. you could uh, step in and try to affect change in that area. And so few people mm -hmm. get involved in local politics uh, that you can definitely make some progress or you could get sued. That could happen. But uh, yeah. there there well, are a million that. things. <laughs> there are a million things people can get involved in, in at the local level, uh, from tax policies to stupid ordinances to surveillance to uh, you name it. So I would really encourage mm -hmm. people to look for opportunities at the local level. You don't want to get involved in state politics. That's cool. Uh, you don't want to get involved in federal politics. I don't either. Uh, but there's always stuff at the local level that needs to be fought. Well, I would definitely say that's completely true. And um, if you're going to run your mouth, maybe put your uh, money where your words are. Um, I know specifically, Mike, that you were involved with the lawsuit and you were sued actually by your, your city. And I find that very interesting. I'm a, a big fan of police accountability and the, um, uh, making the surveillance state accountable. So let us know a little bit about what happened to you in Lexington. So you were just a regular citizen observing some surveillance and then you ended up trying to seek information. So what happened? Yeah, so I did some open records requests to the Lexington Police Department, trying to figure mm -hmm. out what type of surveillance technologies that they were using. Um, and I uh, got a response from the city that they didn't have a lot of the stuff, which I kind of questioned, but that's, that's another story. Uh, but they did admit that they have 29, uh, they call them mobile surveillance cameras. Now you might be asking yourself, what in the hell is a mobile surveillance camera? And we're still asking that question, too, and we're two years later uh, because they don't want to tell us anything about these super secret surveillance cameras. So I appealed their denial of these records to the Kentucky State Attorney General's office, which is the process in Kentucky with open records. If, if a government agency denies a request and it goes to the AG, uh, the AG found in my favor and told the uh, police department to give up these records. And so instead of giving up the records, the Lexington Police Department sued me, uh, which oddly people go, well, how could they do that? Shit. Oddly enough, that's actually the open <laughs> records law in this state. Uh, if, if the AG finds one way or the other, then the other party can sue, but you can't sue the AG who made the decision. You have to sue the other person who asked for the, for the records or this, I could have sued the city if the AG had found in their favor. But anyway, mm -hmm. the uh, city sued me. They uh, wanted me to pay their court costs, which isn't even legal. And uh, fortunately I was, uh, ha have enough friends in influential places that I was able to get the ACLU to represent me in this case. Otherwise I mm -hmm. would have been done. I mean, there's no way that I could have right. fought a lawsuit on my own as an individual citizen. Mm -hmm. And of course the city knows this. That's why they do it. Mm -hmm. They expect you to just go away. And uh, mm -hmm. 
fortunately, I, I have great representation, and we went to the uh, circuit court and we won. And the circuit court told the city to turn over the records, and so the uh, the city went back to the circuit court court and asked for reconsideration, and I won again. And the court told them to turn over the records, and the city still is not giving me the records. We are now at the Kentucky Court of Appeals level, and uh, actually just read the brief that we're submitting to the appellate court. So they'll make a decision. This so slow. Who knows when they'll actually make a decision? Uh, but but so yeah, the the city's they, still fighting me have, on this. They have not presented documents yet. No no no. Hmm. Well, I've got a bunch of redacted documents. Oh shit. <laughs> I've got a bunch of papers with black That's boxes amazing. on them. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. So yeah, yeah, the government, yeah, they're they're just amazing. So wrap your head around this. I'm a I'm a taxpayer. There's my air quotes again. I'm a taxpayer. Mm -hmm. I'm a citizen of this city, and I am basically paying because you you always get these people who tell you, well, we are the government. You know, that's a state of love to tell you, we <laughs> are the government. Yeah. Well, why in the hell am I suing myself? That's retarded. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, uh, well, that's the whole thing about, and we could really get existentialists and go into that. Um, right. Because the government is a group of people that prey on other people and uh, do not, they're not legitimate. They don't. They don't have a contract with other people. They just assume rights over other people, right. and we're all kind of beholden to them because they threaten us under force. And so, yeah, like I get that, but most people don't. <laughs> so if you start there, they're kind of freaked out. Right. You know. But you know that's the cool thing because pretty much everybody. I mean, no matter what part wherever they are on the political spectrum when i say the city's suing me because i ask questions about surveillance they all go what so yeah it's things like that that actually expose the, the state for what it is yeah it's super messed up and I, I don't understand why people still support the state i think it's maybe like it's a knee-jerk reaction people just under like they just oh well they're the cops they're the good guys or whatever and I don't yeah. think a lot of people uh, look beyond that and understand that there's these people that are, are violating your rights. It doesn't matter if they're cops. It doesn't matter um, if they're violating your rights. They are. They have no special rights over you. And so maybe you need to learn about what your rights are, um, which is something what a uh, super strong point of what I do is um, – I think it's really important to uh, make people understand their Fourth Amendment rights, because mm -hmm. the police state they don't they don't the police don't even understand the the laws that they enforce. Like, so no. we need to understand those. Um, Fourth Amendment rights are super important. Um, they, you know, if you get pulled over, you need to understand that. And I don't think most people do. And I think that's super important. And I think that most police officers violate that. And that's something that I'm a huge proponent of is people understanding their rights. But I don't think most people do. So. Hi, guys. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. And I tell people this, you know, because you do get a lot of the people, even with the surveillance thing, you get the people that want to say, well, if you have nothing to hide. And I always ask oh, these God. people. Yeah, I hate that. crazy. But I've actually been on a, I've done a couple of radio shows and, and I will actually I've actually asked them, OK, you got nothing to hide. Then please send yeah. me your browsing history for the last mm -hmm. year. And I'm going to publish it on my website. And nobody's taken right. me up on that yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and the truth of the matter is privacy is a fundamental part of self-ownership. You know, the mm -hmm. ability to keep parts of us private is, is really a fundamental thing. I don't even like terming, mm -hmm. terming it Fourth Amendment rights because the Fourth Amendment really just prohibits the government. No, that's from true. Yeah, them. that's but, true. But, and but those that, rights are natural anyways. So it's exactly. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's just amazing that people are just willing to give up that basic 
the basic elements of self ownership because they think they have nothing to hide. And the truth of the matter is, you do have you have plenty of things to hide. Mm-hmm. That's why you have curtains on your right. your house. That's why you lock your doors. Mm-hmm. It's why you have passwords on your email. We all have things that we you know we might not have to hide them, but we want to hide them because we have mm-hmm. a right to this space that is us. And uh, you we know, government right is trying to, to infringe privacy. on that all the time. Absolutely. We have a right to privacy and the government has no right to infringe on that. And exactly. people don't understand that. And and when people say, if you have nothing to hide, you should bear this. No, that has nothing to do with that. If I have nothing to hide, it's nobody's business. Right. It's not the police business. It's not the government's business. It's my business. If I've never harmed anybody, well, fuck off. <laughs> not your business. <laughs> there you go. I'm That's right. Sorry. <laughs> you said there would be there's, swearing. There's some swearing. There was, but I just I feel very um I'm very compelled by that, and I think it's really creepy when people want to give over their rights to the government. I think that it's a, a really strange position, and I think maybe it comes from a point of people being conditioned to give over information to the government, and. I don't think that's a good thing. No. So, no. Hey, Maharis. Hi, <laughs> Stuart. Hi. Um, so <laughs> let's let's play one more. Uh, let's play one more game before we right. let go. Okay. So are you are you guys ready? We're ready. Yes. Got my board. Got my board. Got your board? Got my board. Right. Okay. So you have to answer in kind for the other person for this. Right. You ready? Yes. If you had two weeks and money was not an object, where would you go? You have to answer this for your partner. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you money oh. we both say the same thing for each other. Oh, there's the music. I like what? the music. That's good, isn't it? That's Casey. That's kind of a badass. <laughs> You're a badass. <laughs> Are you ready? All right. Yes. Cynthia, reveal your answer. Mike Meharry would say Turks and Caicos. <laughs> okay. Good thing. Okay, Mike, and Cynthia your would answer say. Down. Caicos. Yes, I would. Ah, you guys did good. Are you fancy pants? That's where we went on Simpatico. our honeymoon. Simpatico. Very fancy. Actually, so uh, so you know people want to have they they've they've got these different ideas where you're going to have your libertarian utopia, you know. So they had like the right. free state project, and they're going to go to New Hampshire. Yes. Our libertarian oh, utopia has to be tropical. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm well, not doing there's no New Anar- Hampshire. Anarchapulco, but it's super Mexican. Mexico is very annoying to me. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I could, I could okay. possibly do that. I don't know. It's warm. Yeah. Warm is, is the overriding like, concern I'm okay for us. I'm with that. Yeah. You know, people always tease I Michael Mexico Bolton. Mexico a lot last year. I'm, yes, you did. <laughs> so, yes. so Michael Bolton, the founder and director of the 10th Amendment Center, he lives yes. in, in Los Angeles. And people give mm-hmm. him crap all the time. You know, why do you live in L.A. in that commie state? And he always says, "Well, I like my tyranny warm." And I think that's honestly, I think that's he's legit. Not wrong. <laughs> he's not wrong. No, honestly, it's going to be negative thirteen on Wednesday. Yeah, we're we're like negative five, Through so that. you're a little bit colder than yeah. us. It's going to be horrible. I don't blame people for living in California. Honestly, yeah. And I have good friends that live there too, so whatever. Just fight the commies there. Right. And we'll be cold and have less commies here. (laughs) What we're going to do. All right. We've had a really wonderful, I don't know what we've had, but it's been super fun. There's certainly been some shenanigans. Yes. There have Definitely been shenanigans. I'm not sure what, what we've accomplished, but I've had a super what good time. What libertarian show are you <laughs> going to talk about the surveillance state and genealogy 
in the same show. Yes. I don't know, but we've had fun, and I'm certain that the guys from Disenthrall are enjoying this. Oh, wait. I might have another question. Oh, cool. Okay. I, I, I'll give you this because it's from Disenthrall. What are the most hopeful, successful prospects you've seen so far for the 10th, 10th Amendment Center outside of states legalizing, decriminalizing cannabis? We did that one. About, that's, we did, I thought, but that's a new question. Maybe they tuned in late. Appar apparently, a lot of... Um, Libertarian. Did somebody ask about are really concerned about cannabis. Trisha, scroll down. Yes. <gasps> it's down it's lower. Cat. This is the disembodied voice of the producer. Scroll down. There's more <laughs> questions. Right. Okay, Whoa, I'll scroll down. It's That's a mystery. Gonna <laughs> okay, I'm gonna scroll down. That's Patrick. He's a. I'm scrolling down. Okay, I'm scrolling down. Because I love these guys. Okay. Okay, if a okay, I'll give you another question because he's being right. super cool. Okay, if a bill gives you a a slice towards liberty, but also includes some other concessions towards statism, would you support it? I would fancy. need a, a specific example of what they're talking about. I mean. Statism is the, is the is the default position that we're in. I mean, by by its very nature, a bill is statism, right? Because it's going through the right. legislature. Um, I mean, in in a sense, any time that there's a piece of legislation, you're you're conceding statism, right? Um, right. So, I mean, pretty much everything we do, if you're going to you know use use that term as the as a kind of definition, and yeah, I mean. You know, some people would say that that simply engaging in the system, you're engaging in statism and you're supporting the system mm -hmm. and you are, uh, in effect, initiating violence against other people. And, uh, you know, that's that's kind of a, of a deeper debate than I think we want to get into here. But, you know, okay. I, I, I well, kind of use I Tom. Go, I want to kind of go into that, Mike, actually. Well, I would use so, I like Tom to. Woods' analogy. I'll get, I'll use the Tom. Okay. I'll steal Tom Woods's analogy on that. You know, if you're if you're a slave on a plantation, and mm -hmm. you can vote to um, get more food, are you going to say no? I'm not going to do that because I'm supporting the system of slavery. No, you're going to get more food. No, right? Okay. So you know, again, my position is very pragmatic in terms of political activism. Uh, we have this situation. Uh, let's let's be honest. I'm going to be real honest. I'm going to hurt some of the anarchist feelings. We are not going to get a free society oh, no. in our lifetime. It's not oh, going to happen. Don't say me that. <laughs> it's not. We're the human. Okay. The human mind is not there. Human beings like government. Oh. They want their stuff. They want to be ruled over. They want to be protected. And until we can get more people, it's growing. I mean, in the last four or five years, it's amazing to see how many more people have have embraced the ideas of liberty. But we're still this little tiny. I think sometimes we get in this. I call it the the libertarian ghetto, and we think we're really important. Mm -hmm. And we argue about all of these inane yeah. things. And really, there's about fifty six of us, you know. Yeah. And and the other hundred and fifty billion people agree. out there going, what the fuck? <laughs> so I mean, we, we need to yes. live in the real world. So there yeah, was my F bomb. I Sorry. know. Wait. Oh, you did the F bomb. You know what? I wouldn't say that I disagree. Hey, disenthrall. Scroll back to me. Um, they're pretty cool, so they will. Okay. So I don't disagree with your point. It's just that I think that if we could reach a few more people, like locally and like people that are prone to be liberty minded, that we might make a bigger difference. I don't know if that means anything. I have no clue. Um, I'm hosting a podcast where I'm trying to not say swear words. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if that's even a thing, but um, I understand your position, where you're coming from, but I just think if you can change a few hearts and minds, 
and we all do that, then it can make such a huge impact. Well, I tell people this. This is kind of I wrote an article for Godarchy on this on this subject. You know, if you go back to 1820 and you told people that slavery was going to be gone in 45 years, nobody would have believed you. That was such a minority position. The idea of abolition was such a minority position at that time. And so it took a change of hearts and minds to get to the point where slavery would go away. Now, some people would say it would take a war. I would argue that that was it was going to happen with or without the war. If you would ask somebody in 1600, hey, do you think we could have a, a government based on representation without a king based on this written document? They would have been like, no. We can't have that. There had to be a philosophical underpinning that developed through the 1600s and 1700s in order to make the idea of a constitutional republic possible. I think we're in the beginning stages now of laying the philosophical groundwork to make a stateless society possible. And for that to happen, we need more people to embrace that philosophy. Right now, it can't happen because there's not enough people. But when people say, well, it's impossible, uh, you'll never have stateless society. Well, no, that's not true because people would have said you'll never not right. have slavery and you'll never not have, you'll never be able to have a constitutional right. republic. So it's an evolution. And we're, I think we're at the, the beginning stages of seeing that groundwork laid. You know, we're in the 1600s when John Locke was writing about natural rights and and laying the foundation mm -hmm. for uh, uh, you know what we call classical liberalism, and so now we're laying the foundation mm -hmm. today for uh, for stateless society, and I think that that that's very important work. And really, from a uh, from a pragmatic standpoint, I think that there's a place for all of us. We need people who are just doing the aggregate kind of stuff, where they're mm -hmm. figuring out ways to just get mm -hmm. around the government. Completely. And we need things like the 10th Amendment Center that are breaking down federal power and, and working towards decentralization. And we need the LP and we need all of these people doing their thing and working mm -hmm. together. And I really wish that we would do less fighting with each other and arguing about, well, your way is the wrong way uh, and, and, mm -hmm. and just support each other and cooperate in these efforts and, and see that that slowly but surely we can move towards the type of society that, that we want. So, you know, that's that's my spiel. I don't think anybody is wrong. I don't think it's wrong to withdraw from the system or to to, you know, not get involved in politics. I respect that position immensely. I get frustrated when they come to me and say, well, you're not a real libertarian because you're doing did it did. Well, you know, whatever. Um, but well, I think we need all of these things happening at the same time. And that's how we're going to move things forward. In rant. I, I actually I know I agree with your rant to. Um... I get a lot of shit for being involved with the LP. Um, but I would say that there's a lot of people that are keyboard warriors that just argue with people and they have make no difference. And so if you can change people's hearts and minds and uh, give them information and maybe change their hearts through the internet or whatever, then I think it's a great thing. Um, yep. So I quite agree. I think there's a lot of people that sit at home behind their keyboards and don't do any service to anybody else. And um, they'll never change somebody's hearts or minds. Uh, I do. I am active in the LP, but that's just because I use it as a bullhorn platform. I don't actually think that it's in its like uh, service is going to change anybody's like lives. I know they probably hate me for that. Um, <laughs> to me, but like yeah, who knows electing somebody happen. means nothing. Electing somebody means nothing to me. Um, but being able to tell people about liberty through a political party does mean something. So yeah, that's how I act through that. Um, and I know that you're not a huge political activist so you're not going to join the Mises caucus which we're sad that wish you would you're not gonna I, just, I, I don't I don't do I'm not into candidate politics that's just not okay. my thing but I'm into I'm into policy politics and issue oriented politics but again I think there's a place for for each and every one of us to get well I can't do everything you know I'm doing enough already <laughs> um, so right. 
you know, more power to, I, I love the Mises caucus guys and, and, and respect and appreciate what they're doing. And, you know, I've lended a hand on some things as well. So, but uh, we, we've all got to find have. our place and do our thing. Yes, I know you have, and thank you. And so Michael Heiss will be very grateful for this part of our um, interactive. Anyways, you guys have been wonderful. I've had such a good time with you. Um, and so I'm probably going to close out our discussion. And so if do you, do you want to plug anything or promote anything? Let me know. Well, I'll just do my normal rundown of things people should go to. Uh, Okay. Go to 10th Amendment Center .com, Check out what's going on over there. Uh, we've got articles and blog posts, fresh content every single day. Uh, if you are interested in our work, support what we're doing as far as breaking down federal power or using nullification, nullification and decentralization, become a <laughs> member. We'd appreciate that support. Um, so that's 10th Amendment Center .com. You spell it all out, T-E-N-T-H. Uh, you can follow my work at michaelmeharry.com. Uh, that's where my podcast thoughts from a hairy head is and if you're a believer in christ and you're interested in that intersection of politics and theology and christianity uh go to godarchy.org i've got a relatively new podcast over there and uh that's probably where my heart is in in terms of, of my work that doesn't, doesn't generate any income but but it's kind of my heart and soul right there and so if people are interested in that we we shove a crowbar between state and church that's, that's my moniker. So yeah. check that out, godarchy.org. And then if you're interested in genealogy or if you need any genealogy work, tell me your website. Oh, this is yeah, pretty yeah, awesome. Yes. Preteritum.weebly.com. P R A E T R I T U M. Okay. That's super awesome. Actually, I, I actually love genealogy and I going to actually send you some information because I want to find out things about my family. Um, Perfect. Also, also my Godarchy is I know it's like your smallest project, but it's my favorite. And so I would love My that. favorite so, too. That's that's yeah, where I get I into the actual Godarchy. philosophy and I get to I get to say kill the state. Yeah. Oh, I would say something else, but I'll be really nice right now. Um, but <laughs> Blank I've state. already f bombed, so that's that's your f bomb ah. for this episode. Okay, good. I'm trying to be nice. It's not helping. <laughs> um, but f the state, and I love Godarchy, and I love um, anarcho-capitalism within the uh, looking at it through a Christian perspective. So I really enjoy yep. that. So people, go look to Godarchy. Um, there's also some other cool sites too so you can send me a message if you want to find out about those and um if you're interested in genealogy you can look at the show notes because i'll have some links um and the maharias are badass and i love you guys so thanks for joining um disenthrall has produced this uh pr production did you say production that's fine whatever um <laughs> so they're pretty badass you should probably follow disenthrall they have wonderful productions and they're pretty badass so if you don't follow them you're a horrible person so, pretty much but i want you pretty much so we're gonna peace out love you